You know, one of the things that I think is uh, more important than just learning the Bible is living the Bible. And I think that uh, often we're, we misunderstand or we forget that. We think if we learn the Bible that uh, we're really accomplishing something. And we are accomplishing something, but we're not accomplishing all that God wants us to. He wants us to live the Bible and not just learn the Bible. And so that's why I think we need to do a review of the little uh, book of Philippians, the four chapters. And uh, I want to approach them uh, as uh, we went through them. I had a different title for each one of them that really keys in on what I think the important truth is in each of those chapters. I'm calling this review Putting Philippians into Practice because that's what we need to do. And so, uh, I know, I'd probably be better if it was up here on the screen or if you had sheets of paper. But, you know, if you take notes, there's going to be some things that perhaps would be significant for you to write down that you could yourself review uh, in your own time alone. So let's do that, but let's pray first. Father, we want to thank you for your word, and we want to thank you specifically for the little book, the letter of that Paul wrote to the Philippians. We thank you for the theme and uh, just for the power of the truth that is in it. And we do want to apply it in our lives. We want to see it work. Lord, I ask that you would direct us now and that you would use this time to remind us of some truths that perhaps we, we connected with as we looked at each chapter, but we need, Lord, to have it uh, reestablished in our thinking and then worked out through our life. We even think of that, that passage in Philippians 2.12, where we're, we're told to work out our own salvation, or to work out this truth that you give us in the book. And so enable us to do that now, we pray. Give us the ability to concentrate and to get all the good from this to work it out in our lives that you intend for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, chapter one. Got your Bible, please. Turn with me to Philippians chapter one, and we'll quickly review this chapter as much as, uh, and as quickly as we can. The key, I think the big truth in Philippians one is the key verse, which I think is verse 21, don't you? Where Paul says, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I boil all of that down to simply say this, and this is, was the title for chapter one. Jesus is the Christian life. Jesus is the Christian life. That's the big truth of Philippians chapter one. He died for us. And you know what? This is so much review from what we talked about this morning. Because Paul, he pounds this home in letter after letter. Uh, he's the one that really unfolds this whole idea that the Lord died for us in order that he might live in us. He died for us that he might live in us. That you might experience, listen to me, Jesus as your very life that you might experience Jesus as your very Christian life, because that's what he is. I think that understanding this truth and applying it, letting it work in you, is really the secret to the Christian life. It's the secret to human life, I might say, is that Christ is in you, and it takes God in you to be the person that he created you and intends you to be. It takes God in you. So I would simply say this. There is not a single person whose life is complete without Christ in it. 
Without Jesus in you, your life is incomplete. You're, you're, you're not the human being you're meant to be. So as we said this morning, the first important thing that we need to be sure of is Christ in me. Is Christ in me. If he is, then you are on track to be the person that God desires you to be. With Jesus in your life, you know, there's a lot of talk about you as a human being reaching your highest potential, okay? You can do anything, right? <laughs> Isn't that what they tell you, the hype? You can do anything you set your mind to. That's baloney. That's not true. There are some things that we might set our mind to that we'll never be able to do ourselves. I'd never be able to, to uh, run a corporation like some CEO, you know, that runs a multi, like let's say the, the uh, a automobile company. I could never do that. Set my mind to it, never accomplish it. So that's not the point. The point is there is potential, spiritual potential in every believing life that you will never reach until you learn to depend upon the fact that Jesus is the Christian life, that Jesus is your life, and that he can bring you to that, those spiritual heights that otherwise you would never attain to. That there is a higher level of spiritual living that you and I can attain to. That's true. None of us are living on the highest spiritual plane. Even Paul, remember what he said in this book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 12? I haven't apprehended. I haven't arrived. I'm not on the highest spiritual level that I want to be. And so chapter 1 is Jesus is the Christian life, and that he can enable you, he can enable you to reach a higher level of living spiritually. You can realize even that whatever your situation is, it's okay because it can be used to exalt Christ and it can be used to advance the gospel. That's what chapter one's about. That there is that that gospel success is through Christ's life in you. You know, we talk about witnessing, soul winning, evangelism. The success of that is all about Christ's life in you. Someone told me recently that a person in their apartment building uh, stopped them and said, they're the, not a believer, stopped this person and said, you know, um, <clears throat> there's something about you. I'd like to have coffee with you. Wow. You see? So what is that? That uh, they're seeing Christ <laughs> in that person. They're seeing the Lord at work in that person's life, and that has stirred desire and uh, curiosity. So it's not about protecting our lives because our lives aren't ours, they're his. It's not about protecting our life, it's about Christ. And so you're not your own, and it's not about you, and so your life on this earth is to be lived to honor Christ in every way, and really nothing else matters. I mean, I know a lot of things matter to you and me. But when it comes down to it, if everything that matters to us does not exalt the Lord, does not accomplish his purpose, it really doesn't matter. It might matter to you, but it really doesn't matter. Because Jesus is the Christian life. Okay? Any questions about that before we move on to chapter 2? He said it, remember, in verse 21, for to me, I don't know about you, but according to Paul, for him, to live was Christ. Christ was his life. Is Christ your life? Can you say, for to me, to live is fill in the blank? What is it? Your job? <laughs> Having this, going there, you know, people's bucket list. For me to live is Christ. Questions, comments, thoughts before we look at chapter two? Yeah. 
when uh, Richie passed away, um, there was a little chalkboard in the room. So I was with him when he passed away, and I wrote that verse on the chalkboard. Wow. Me to live is Christ and to die. And to die is gain. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Do you hear that? When her husband passed away, some of you may not realize, but her husband had cancer, blood cancer, and he passed away. And uh, Philippians 121, she wrote it up on the, the little marker board in front of his bed. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. It is gain. Okay. Chapter 2, then. Ready for chapter 2. Chapter 2, I think the key verse in chapter 2 is verse 5, where Paul says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Now, if Christ is your life, then his mind is your mind, right? In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.16, but you have the mind of Christ, and you do, but you don't always tap it. You don't always benefit from it. The mind, let this mind be in you. In other words, it's a personal choice, even though you have the mind of Christ. It's a personal choice for you to use it, to apply it, to have it function in your mind. When I talk, when we talk about the mind, we're not talking about the brain. We're not talking about that uh, that organ in your head. When we talk about the mind, we're talking about the intellectual part of your innermost being called your heart, your soul. That's made up of your mind. That's, that's your thinking. Uh, it's, and that's your, your affections, and that's your, your choosing, your will. So the mind of Christ. And remember how we talked about Jesus' function on earth. If we're going to have the mind of Christ, then we have to function in our bodies on this earth the way that Jesus functioned in his earthly body when he was on this earth. And you remember what it was? It was not I, but the Father. Especially John's gospel brings that out, where Jesus in many ways, and even in those words, says not I, but the Father. And that really is two parts to Jesus' thinking, the mind of Christ. Number one, not I is surrender. It's surrender. It's saying no to self. It's saying yes to God. Not I is surrender, but the Father, that's dependence. And those are two vital parts of the mind of Christ. Not only do you have to say no to yourself, not I, and surrender, but you also must depend upon him, but the Father. And we said that Jesus, of course, depended upon the Holy Spirit to reveal the Father's will to him and uh, to animate and, uh, and empower and enable him. Remember, the Holy Spirit uh, enabled him to grow in grace. It tells us in Luke chapter 2, in his uh, childhood and uh, young adulthood, and then at his baptism, when he begins his public ministry, the Holy Spirit descends upon him and anoints him for the ministry that he had. So he's dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And we said, you're in Christ. Christ is in you. And uh, the mind of Christ is in you. But for it to function in you, the mind of Christ, you got to come to the place where you say, it's not I, but Christ. Not I, you surrender yourself. But Christ, you depend upon the Holy Spirit. You depend upon Christ himself. That is really a life that is explained in chapter 2 in the, in the opening verses. And I want to call your attention to verse 3 the mind of Christ. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, pride, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem or value others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, that's selfish living, but every man also on the things of others, that's thinking of others. 
And so the mind of Christ, saying not I but Christ, is selfless. It's not about yourself. It, you're not in it for yourself. It's humbleness, not true, not for vain glory. It's humbleness. You're unconcerned about how you might look, how you might appear to others, what your reputation might be. It's also, as he says in verse 14, doing all things without murmurings. It's recognizing, you know what? I'm unworthy. It's not that I pity myself because I deserve better, but it's recognizing my unworthiness. This is all part of the mind of Christ. And he says in verse 14, do all things without disputings, and that's trying to bargain with God, or it's, it's about agreeing with the Lord. In other words, self-interest has to be replaced by selflessness or by self-sacrifice. That's the mind of Christ. And in verses 12 and 13, he tells us how that's accomplished. Chapter 2, verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. I think this was a memory verse, right? Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. And then he explains what he means by that. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's how the Holy Spirit enables you and I to live a self-sacrificing life and thus function with the mind of Christ. Think like he thinks. It's Jesus' thinking instituted into our thinking and living according to the way he thinks. What do you think? <laughs> Philippians 2. Any questions about that or any thoughts about it? The mind of Christ. So Jesus is the Christian life, and as a result of that, we need to have his mind function in us. Yes. Okay. When you said about the surrender dependence and the dependence, yeah. can, can we say, is the surrender, I'm in Christ and the dependence is Christ in me? Well, I guess yes and no, okay. because the surrender and the dependence isn't automatic. The, mo the moment you're saved, you're in Christ and Christ is in you. Uh -huh. That is automatic. Right. So I don't think it's the same thing, because uh -huh. to surrender, you have to make a personal choice. It doesn't happen automatically. And... To depend upon the Lord, you have to make a personal choice over and over and over again. It doesn't happen automatically. So I can't, I, it, yeah. it involves that. It involves the, the yes, fact that uh, you're in Christ and Christ in, is in you is the means whereby you can surrender and you can depend, but they're not the same thing. Surrender and dependence are a personal choice that we make. And I like to think of it this way. It's like building a building. There, there is a, a foundation in a building, and there is a time in a person in a Christian's life, and it may happen at the moment when they're saved. Sometimes it, it happens later after that. But there's a time when you just totally surrender your life to the Lord, all of it. That's like laying the foundation on a building, okay? But then... A building isn't complete when the foundation's laid. You have to build, put bricks or cement blocks or, you know, wooden structure. You have to build a frame over that foundation, <laughs> close it in, you know. That's, I think, every piece of wood in that uh, building on the foundation or every block or brick is a, another surrender, another area of surrender. So it's not a one-time thing. Neither is dependence. <laughs> it's, it's a constant. You're, you're putting another brick of dependence in this moment on the Lord. So 
it's it's a big thing, but it's also little steps along the way as well. Yeah, I think I've been lately doing half the equation. <laughs> surrender. <laughs> surrender, surrender, surrender. Yeah. But forgetting to that's depend. that's so important, and it's so important that you brought that up. And I have uh, tried to make this distinction before. This is where most Christians stop. They see Romans 12, 1 and 2, yeah. and they surrender to the Lord, but then they don't know how to make that how to make that operative in their life. Well, the surrender has to also have the dependence part. You can't surrender and then just make up your mind by your sheer sheer willpower. You're going to to Forge ahead, surrendered. You have to depend upon the Lord because there's step by step, moment by moment, surrenders that you can't do without your dependence upon him. And so someone has illustrated it this way. Have you ever been in a rowboat? You know, uh, in a rowboat, <clears throat> you have two wooden oars. And if you use one oar, it'll turn you one direction. If you use the other oar, it'll turn you in the other direction. If you just want to go straight, you got to use both oars at the same time, and that'll that'll make you go straight. And if you and if you veer off to one direction, then you just use uh, you you just use one oar to put you back on the straight path. Surrender is one oar, and dependence is the other oar. If all you do is surrender in your Christian life, you're going to be going around in circles, and that's defeating. That is really frustrating and defeating because you don't understand. How comes I'm not being victorious? Where is the victory in the Christian life? I've surrendered to the Lord, and but you're just going around in circles because you haven't implemented the second or of dependence. You can't be surrendered without depending upon the Lord. And that'll put you on the straight path of victory when you use both oars. That makes sense? Yes. yes. So that's uh, the mind of Christ, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the process of sanctification, it involves the surrender. This is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking about that verse, when I am weak, then he is strong. Yes. And, you know, sometimes we use it when we're going through things and we can't do it now. But we're not supposed, we're supposed to be weak. So we can All the time. Right. And you know what that word weakness means? That word weakness doesn't mean that, okay, God's strong, and I'm not as strong as him. I'm strong, but not as strong. That word weakness means, listen to me, strengthlessness. In other words, I don't have an ounce of strength. I don't have one iota of strength. So in order to be the recipient of and to be strengthened by the Lord, you have to come to the place where you recognize and you admit that I have absolutely no ability of my own. I need your ability completely, 100%. It's not God 90% and me 10%. It's God 100% working through me. My part is not passive. My part isn't passivity. My part is to cooperate with God by obeying him. I take that step knowing I can't do this, but I'm depending upon him to be able to do it through me. And he enables me to take that step and accomplish what I couldn't accomplish. I'm weak. He's strong. I have no strength. He has all strength. That's what it means. Yeah. And that's in everything. That's not just in the, in the things that are overwhelming to us. It's in everything. Because Jesus is the Christian life. He's the only one that can live it. I can't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 13, what she's saying is that's the whole, that's the whole thing in a nutshell. <laughs> this is why you need to depend on God because it's him that is working in you, giving you a desire to surrender. And then he enables you to actually surrender. As you depend upon him, he gives you the ability. So God gives you the desire, whatever it is he wants. 
and then he enables you to do that. There's nothing that God gives you the desire to do that you can't do if you'll depend on him. Okay? Yes. I saw Ben and Andrea go through so many setbacks. And I think they're never going to stay. They went so wrong. They stayed, they got through, they just constantly were, were being knocked down and they came back and they came back. And I just see them as an example of this. Let me tell you, I have some inside information on that. And there's, there's been, there was some close calls where they almost threw in the towel. And the only thing is, not because of their strength, but because they finally turned to God and took his strength. And that's true of every one of us. That's true not only of them, it's true of us. It's just the way we are, yeah. I was going to say, so contrary to the world's way of seeing things, Yeah. Absolute opposite. It's, and that's the way it is, right? The Christian life is so opposite the world's thinking. That's why worldly wisdom won't work. Earthly wisdom, in fact, earthly human wisdom has its uh, has its roots in the demonic unseen realm. That's what James says. That's what Jesus said to Peter when he was thinking humanly. And so you can't do it. Human wisdom says, you know, you got to be this, this great uh, leader that uh, whips everyone into line. Jesus said, if you're going to be my leader, you got to be a servant. You got to wash feet. You know, you got to be willing to, to humble yourself and be a servant in order to be a great leader. It's the opposite of what the world teaches. I mean, they don't teach that in, in, in corporate uh, settings, do they? They teach you, man, you go for it. You you step on anyone and everyone you have to in order to get where you want to get, where you want to go. Opposite in the Christian life. Yeah. It's not only for our benefit that we surrender to friends and we get to have a victorious Christian life, but then in verses 15 and 16, that we might shine as light. That's the only way that we could actually show forth God yes. and his word. Um, that's how people see Christ. Yeah. Amen. Okay. So that's the mind of Christ. Chapter two, chapter three. Uh, I think the key verse is the 10th verse. And, uh, the 10th verse is that famous one that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. And then verse 11, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Chapter three is it, it in Christ alone is the title that I gave that chapter. That is faith, dependence in Christ alone. In the first uh, eight verses, uh, or nine verses, it's about dependence in Christ alone for salvation. But beginning in, in chapter uh, 3 and verse 10 on down, it's dependence in Christ alone for sanctification. That's what he's talking about. The way to know Jesus, as well as the way to enjoy and achieve all, that, all the provision that is included in salvation, to know him more intimately, to, be, uh, to fully experience Jesus as your life, to become more like him. That's what he's talking about in verse 10 and 11. It's through faith. It's through, it's exactly what we were looking at this morning in Colossians 2, verse 6. As ye have received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk you in him. Faith is the key. Dependence upon God is the access point to eternal life and to living the Christian life. That's what chapter 3 is about. It's faith in Christ alone. He's the one that saves, and he's the one that sanctifies as we depend upon him. 
But uh, the power is resurrection, verse 10. That, uh, think about that. The power inherent in Jesus' resurrection. That's power that, I mean, it's, it's incomprehensible, unparalleled. The power that brought Christ back from death, from human death, brought him forth from the dead. That's a power that can overcome all resistance, and that power resides in every believer. That kind of power, that's unlimited. Resurrection power lives in you because the resurrected Christ lives in you. And it's him, it's his life, it's resurrection life, it's resurrection power life. It could overcome all resistance. You got a sin that you get hung up on? You got some particular area in your life that you can't kick it? You can't, you can't beat it? It's because you're not depending upon the resurrection power of the living Christ in you. That overcome, that power can overcome all resistance. It's in you. Why don't you take advantage of it? How do you know that? How do you get that power? How does that become operative? Well, he tells us in that 10th verse, and it's not very encouraging. Because in order to enjoy resurrection power in our lives, you know what has to happen to us? We have to become one that shares in the sufferings of Christ. We have to be willing to share in his son. And you know what? Serious believers, we're told it's going to be inevitable. If you're a serious believer, you're going to suffer for the Lord. Now, if no one knows you're a Christian and you don't, you don't have anything to evidence that in the way that you live and you keep your mouth shut and you don't live it, no one's going to know you're a Christian, it'll be okay. But if you're a serious Christian, number one, it's going to show in the way you live. It's going to show in the way that you do your business. It's going to show in the way that you, you carry out your job. It's going to show in the way that you talk with people. You care about people. It's going to, it, it's going to come out, and you won't be able to keep your mouth shut. Certain times, the Holy Spirit will say, now you have to say that. Now you have to speak up. And when that happens, you're going to suffer persecution. It's inevitable. Serious Christians will suffer persecution. The Bible teaches that. So are you ready? Are you willing to share in Christ's sufferings in relationship to being a believer? That's what he says will enable you to experience resurrection power that's, in, that's already in you. <clears throat> Well, for you to be willing to fellowship with his sufferings, you know what has to happen? You must also be made, you have to be willing to make, be made conformable to his death. That is, become like him. That word conformable in uh, that 10th verse, we get our English word metamorphosis from it. You know what a metamorphosis is? Here's an illustration of it. You got this ugly green caterpillar and it becomes a beautiful monarch butterfly. Total different species from one species to another. That's what metamorphosis is. It's an inward change. It's an inward metamorphosis that happens conformed. We're metamorphosized, notice this, into his death. That is, before you experience the resurrection power or the resurrection life of Jesus, you have to be willing to keep on dying to your self-life. You have to die to your self-life and, and be willing to keep on dying to it. Well, what's your self-life? It's what you want. It's what you love. It's what you like. It's what you want to do with your life. It's where you want to go. It's your plans. It's your desires. It's your ambitions. That's what your self-life is, and you got to die to that or you'll never experience the inherent resurrection power of Jesus in you. That's how you become like him, being made conformable to his death. Before you experience resurrection power, you have to keep dying to self. That's what he means in verse 11. 
when he says, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection. He's not talking about a future resurrection of the body. He uses a different word. That word resurrection literally means out-resurrection. And what I believe in the context he's talking about, because in the next verse he says, I haven't already attained that, but I'm pressing toward the mark. He's talking about perfect, complete sanctification. And he says, I haven't arrived there. Uh, but he says, uh, what I'm doing is I am, I'm, I want to take hold of that. I want to attain, I want to attain that perfection is what he's talking about. I want to become more and more like Jesus. That's why we sang that song, by the way, more and more like him, because that's what he's talking about when he says being made conformable unto his death. I want to become more and more like him. And as you do, the self-life gets replaced by the resurrection life of Jesus, which is powerful. Questions about chapter 3? Our comments? It's in Christ alone, all of it. Okay, chapter 4. I titled chapter four, No Worries, because it's about peace and prosperity from God's standpoint, not from the human standpoint. And uh, to enjoy God's peace and prosperity, I think we need to let go of two things. In chapter three and verse 13, Paul said, I count not myself to have been apprehended. I haven't arrived spiritually to the level I want to. But he said, this one thing I do. I forget those things which are behind. I really believe that if you and I, as Christians, will ever, will ever reach that place where we experience God's peace in our life, we have to forget past bitterness. And there's a lot of you sitting here, you're still hung up on people or circumstances that you are bitter with that go back in, your, in the past that you haven't let go of. You haven't released them or released that situation to the Lord and said, God, it's okay. I'm leaving it into your hands. I'm committing it to you as unto a faithful creator. You got to forget if you're going to know this no worries type Christian life to enjoy. You got to let go of your bitter past. And also you have to come to a present and future where you give your worries to the Lord. Look at verse six of chapter four. He says, be careful for nothing. That is, don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. That's what verse 6 really is all about. And what will be the result? The peace of God that passeth all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You'll have an inward peace. You will have a supernatural God-given peace. And notice it's based upon prayer. You take your worries and you cast them on the Lord. That's what Peter meant when he said, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So in prayer, you take your worries for the present and future, and you cast them on the Lord, and you make them his, and you walk away a lot lighter because you no longer have the burden of worries and cares on your shoulders, you've already committed them to the Lord. And thus, he says, there will be put in you, if you will make that exchange of your anxiety, your worries for the present or future, if you'll transfer them to me, I will transfer my peace to you. I'll put my peace, and Jesus said it, my peace give I unto you. Not as the world gives. He's going to give you a supernatural peace. It's produced by the Holy Spirit. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? 
So it's supernatural. It's not human, humanly devised or worked up. He said, if you will do this, if you will trust your problems to me, your worries to me, I will replace them with a supernatural peace deep inside of you that no, that you can't humanly explain. And he said, it'll keep your heart and your mind. It will guard. The word keep is to, to put on guard duty. God will put on guard duty the peace that he puts in your heart. He'll guard. He'll keep it there. He'll guard it if you'll look to him. Notice, he'll keep your, your heart and your mind. I think the heart refers to the emotions and the, and the affections, and the mind is your thinking. That part of your heart, your soul, okay, your affections and your thinking, he'll guard them. But it also requires really an upward focus. Look at verse 8. Whatever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy, think on these things. That's an upward focus. That's the, that's the secret of living, not letting your thoughts run wild. Bringing your thoughts into the captivity of Christ, committing your thoughts to the Lord, and not just letting them run wild. You know, memories from the past that run wild in your mind, they're very dangerous, and they, they, they will kill spiritual fervor, and they'll, they'll bring you back to uh, days of, of fleshly, sinful living. Don't let them, don't let them run wild. Don't think on those things. Depend upon the Lord to exchange those thoughts. Bring them into the captivity of Christ. Bring your thoughts under control, and you'll learn contentment as well. Verse 11, I've learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. Remember, I said this morning, again, that's self-sufficient. But it's not sufficiency of yourself, but it's sufficiency that you have within yourself because you contain in yourself Jesus himself. Christ in you is your sufficiency. And that's what contentment means. It means to find your sufficiency in Christ. Depend on him then that's what he says. He's learned it, and he says in verse 12, I've been instructed. This is, I, I think when we talked about this last week, I mentioned the fact that <clears throat> the word instruct there is, uh, is used in uh, just uh, classical literature of this original language to refer to a secret initiation process into a mystery religion a pagan mystery religion. Paul uses that word. It's the only time that word instructed, that's, in, that's translated and instructed, is used in the entire New Testament. He's trying to tell us something. You know what? Contentment doesn't come natural. Contentment isn't part of human nature. Contentment is something that you have to be specially learned from the Lord. He will teach you that. I don't think it comes early in, in Christian life. I think contentment comes later on as you submit and depend upon the Lord. He instructs you in contentment, and you, you learn it. It's, it's really, as I said, it's, it's not, a, it, it's not an elementary. It's not a high school. It's not a college. It's a graduate-level course that he instructs you in to learn contentment. It's, I'm still learning it, to be content, whatever the situation is. He learned it. How, but, but how can you do that? Well, verse 13, dependence, here it is again. I can do all things. How? How can I be content in all things? Through Christ, which infuses his ability into my inability, okay, who infuses his strength into my strengthlessness, who infuses his power into my powerlessness, okay, that's no worries, 
I'm going to give you quickly maybe a half a dozen things. And if you have a pen, write this down because this is just really uh, uh, an applicational summary of everything that Philippians says. You ready for it? Number one, how to apply this, these chapters. Surrender to God each day and ask and depend on Jesus to be your life. I'll repeat that. Surrender to God each day, fresh, a, a fresh surrender. Surrender to God freshly each day and ask and depend on Jesus to be your life. That's how to start every day. Start every day by surrendering afresh to God and ask and depend on Jesus to be your life. Second thing, ask and let the Holy Spirit renew your mind through daily time in the Word of God. Ask and and let or allow the Holy Spirit to renew your mind through daily time in the Bible. Okay, number three. Make seeking Christ and spiritual things your number one goal. Make seeking Christ and spiritual things your number one daily goal. Not shopping on Amazon. That's not your, your number one daily goal. Although, I have to admit, it's very enticing. <laughs> because they have everything. <laughs> Make number one daily goal, seeking Christ and spiritual things. That is, remember Colossians 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections, your mind, not on things on this earth, but in heaven. So make seeking Christ and spiritual things your number one daily goal. Number four, ask God to remind you and at necessary times, claim his peace. Ask God to remind you that he gives peace, and at necessary moments, claim it. I mean, why wouldn't you claim it? Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Why wouldn't you claim perfect peace? if he wants to give it to you. four six. here are Philippians. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, by the way, thanksgiving is a part of every prayer, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God. My peace give I unto you. Why wouldn't you take it? Why would you get all... Just take his peace. So ask God to remind you, and at necessary times, claim his peace. Number five, guard your thinking. Guard your thinking. Don't let your thoughts run wild. What's that, daydreaming? Is that what it's called? Don't do that. Don't go there. Don't let your thoughts go uncontrolled. Guard your thinking. Because out of the heart are the issues of life, right? So guard your thinking. And then the last one, ask God to help you to learn to be content and to share with others. And by share... I don't mean just sharing truth. I mean sharing things. Be self-sacrificing in your giving. So ask God to help you learn to be content and share. When you share things with others, you're not greedily holding on to them for yourself. You're content with what you have. So ask God to help you learn to be content. T 
teach, Lord, teach me, instruct me, so I learn how to be content in whatsoever state and share with others. If you're content, you'll share with people. If you're not content, you're greedy. If you're content, you're willing to share. That makes sense? 